as uh, you know, the world is going through its third energy revolution. In the 20th century, we have now the rise of the low carbon energy in the 21st century. Uh, now, like for every revolution, uh, the only thing we're sure of is that we're sure of nothing. So uh, we sense that there's an abrupt change taking place, but we don't know exactly what is the speed of this change, and there are a lot of disagreements. Goldman Sachs recently said that they expected half of the energy to be produced from renewables by 2030. Uh, but apparently the International Energy Agency seems to disagree with that and the figures are changing every year. So we don't know exactly the speed, we don't know exactly the impact on consumers, on business, and it's, there seems to be very competing industrial strategies uh, in that respect. And we also have a lot of debates about uh, what are the technologies that will drive this change. Of course everybody's talking about Tesla, now, the International Energy Agency is saying, well, you know, electric cars is not going to make any big difference. The big difference is actually the solar right now taking place in China. But some people disagree. So there are a lot of uncertainty about that. And uh, we have uh, an extraordinary panel with us today uh, to, to debate these questions. Uh, uh, Olga Bilkova, a member of parliament uh, of Ukraine and probably one of the very best specialists in the energy sector in the region and has been uh, uh, very, very active in the parliament over the last five years on, on energy issues. Uh, Carlos Pasquale, uh, former US ambassador, former special envoy on energy issues globally, and right now uh, senior vice president at IHS Markets. And uh, Boris Banan, who is the vice president for uh, Northland Power. Uh, and who is actually one of the main actors of this change, of this transition taking place. So I'd like first to uh, ask the question to, to Carlos. Carlos, what in your opinion is actually happening now in, in terms of speed, in terms of what are the technologies that are making a difference in the world in this transition? Um, Thomas, thank you. And uh, to all of the people who were involved in organizing the event, thank you. The issue of energy in Ukraine, I, I should just say, has been so fundamental to the country's economic growth, to its independence, um, to the politics of the country, even, because the issue is related to transparency. So it's really appropriate that you're having it, and thank you for letting me participate in, in part of that. This process of energy transition and transformation is fascinating, it's challenging, and as you said, it's constantly evolving and it is going to change. And one of the first things that's important to think about is how you define the problem. If you define it as a transition to renewable energy, you may not get the results that you want. Look at Germany. They've vastly increased the use of renewable energy, but they also have increased their use of coal. And over the past 10 years, emissions in Germany have increased. Right? So The Economist just recently had an a very good article that said, what you need to think about is establishing a target of CO2 emission reductions and then asking the question, how do I get the most efficient result? What's the best mix in order to be able to do that? Now, clearly one of the issues, and with Fatih Barola over here, one of the things he'd say is that in the last three years, the cost of solar energy has gone down by 30%, and in the next three years, it's projected to decrease by another 30%. So reductions in cost and technology. The increased efficiencies in wind in particular, especially with the application of digital technologies. So think digital and the type of technology at the same time. The two are going together. But in Mexico, where I live and work now, um, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec has some of the best wind energy in the world. Companies are now able to come and through the digital analysis know exactly how high to position the turbines what angles to position them on. And before they even build it, they're getting an, an additional 10 to 12% in efficiency. Okay. The issue of electric vehicles is important. Today it constitutes 1% of vehicle sales. We've done some analyses, for example, projecting out to the year 2040 when they might constitute 60% of new vehicle sales. And the interesting thing about it was, in terms of the use of gasoline and diesel, <coughs> a bigger impact is fuel efficiency standards than actual electrification because you still have the existing fleet that's going to continue for a long time. 
So electrification of vehicles is really important, but you have to look at it from that perspective. The one other thing I'll mention, and this is truly important for Ukraine, is the issue of natural gas. Now, Ukraine uses natural gas principally in the generation of heat, not so much in electricity. Most of electricity is nuclear, so zero carbon. S about 35% of it is thermal. Most of that is coal. But it, I'll just give you this anecdote. In the United States, we've had the biggest reductions in CO2 emissions that we have had in a period of 15 years as a result of the transition from coal to natural gas. And so the reason that I go back to my earlier is set your target, create the market mechanisms, integrate technology, but bring the best companies in the world to it because what you need to do is create that competitive environment where in the end what you want is the competition to achieve your goals at the cheapest price because that's what's going to achieve sustainability. If people pay more for clean energy, they won't like it. If they pay the cheapest possible price, then that will become part of commerce and part of daily life. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, Boris, you're actually one of the main actors of this uh, low carbon transition. Uh, so tell us about uh, how you live this transition uh, from an industrial perspective. Right, we, uh, we're a Canadian IPP, independent power producer. We started with a very traditional energy mix of natural gas fired uh, generation. Uh, but we saw the opportunities and the need really to start converting to a renewable platform in increasingly. We did our first onshore winds projects in Canada, solar in Canada. Uh, but what we've really sort of moved aggressively recently is into the offshore wind space in Europe, uh, where you really see the incremental and very, but very large improvements in the cost of energy and what that means for the whole transition. Uh, your ability to use much bigger turbines, to use much, to get better wind out in the, out in the, in the middle of the North Sea somewhere, to get all these things happening. It's the same basic technology, it's a three rotor wind turbine, just bigger, tweak better electronics, all kinds of things that play into it, but you're able to now become a, a much more competitive energy source and increasingly against all other energy sources. For a while we were always tra trying to target the issue of grid parity. Can you do renewable energy as cheaply as you can do other forms of energy? Uh, it takes a while to get there. Just to give an example, in our first offshore wind project, we relied, and everyone to some degree still relies on a subsidy mechanism to guarantee some sort of financing so you can do a project. The subsidy mechanism, and it's a public di discussion, for our first wind, wind, wind project offshore was 167 euros a megawatt hour we were paid. When, when, that, when, that was, when that contract was let, when we wanted, the industry said, you can't do it at that, it's not enough. Our next one came in, it was a little bit different, different parameters, we won't leave that aside. Now they're going in the Dutch waters where our first project was, instead of the government, and here I think is a lesson to our government representatives, uh, although not one I really want to share because it's not convenient for us as a, com as a commercial enterprise. But what has been happening is not so much the driven by the technology, but in the procurement of the power. So it's now left not for a government bureaucrat or a politician or an analyst to think how much do we have to offer in a subsidy to get someone to build our offshore wind project. They say, we'll give you a subsidy, just bid and tell us how much you really need. So we've gone from 167 euros the lax auction in the, uh, in the Netherlands cleared at zero euros. No subsidy. That's grid parity. They're saying we will compete with coal, we'll compete with nuclear, with whatever else is on the horizon, we will compete. That's a huge development. That's something that awaits, and, and it's the same process thing going on onshore wind. They're not going to quite get down to zero, but the costs in, in, in Germany, for example, the latest auctions are extremely low when it's left to an auction system and a competitive process to do that. Uh, so we're sort of following all that. We're trying to get involved at the right time. We're not innovators technologically. We want to see when things happen. But we think that the trend is very clear. And either you get onto the bandwagon and you start doing it, or you commit yourself to coal or other technology, and you're going to be skunked by, by these new ones coming in at a zero subsidy anyways. Wow. Crazy. It is. Yeah. It's a very strange world. What is very interesting is that uh, apparently Denmark would produce 70% of its energy through renewables by 2022. Uh, probably there, there, are, there are days now when they're over when they're at 100 percent. They have no problem. Yeah, but in, in average. Yeah, but the dirty little secret there, I think Carlos already pointed it out. Uh, they're interconnected to well, they have their own coal burning, which they're getting rid of. But they're interconnected to the German grid, 
So when they're short on wind, they're buying power from Germany, which is produced often with coal, okay. right? That's sort of a little secret that they keep buried there. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a fallacy. It's, it's still, the trend is still indisputable. Coal and all those carbon-based things are going down. Renewables are going up. There's just no doubt about In that. In the end, you have to have a base load. It has to come from somewhere. Right. And the question yeah. is, how do you provide it yeah. and how do you finance yeah. it? Yeah. So, Olga. What about Ukraine in this in this mix? How do you see the situation and the evolution and the transition towards a low carbon energy in Ukraine? Yeah, well, I think it's very interesting what this guy's will prognose and that my voters will have to accept and pay for. So for, uh, for any politician, I actually have a slightly different approach of analyzing all these issues. Uh, a few years ago, Carlos introduced me to Daniel Jurgen. And uh, at that point, I was just learning about energy. And I asked him, so tell me, what is the future of energy? And he Excuse said, to interrupt you. There's a bit of sound microphone between. or less than the cost of a, a, a generator for two hours. So if it's working in some countries, if it's working in Kentucky, in Nigeria, and in the Netherlands, why can't it work also in Ukraine? Well, it will work uh, when politicians and governments will become very, uh, very honest in terms of real price of uh, electricity uh, produced from different types of generations. 
as of now, if you look at our average pri uh, price, which is regulated by energy regulator, it looks like nuclear power is the most, uh, the cheapest energy. But if you include all negative, positive externalities, actually market price is a little bit higher. There is still cross subsidization in, in our system, of uh, economic system, which is used to kind of mislead a little bit both investors and consumers, and it provides a message that there is such thing as cheap energy. I actually think clean energy will be very cheap in Ukraine if we are very honest to remove all the subsidies. And if we open up market for many players, if we see more auctions happening on behalf of, let's say, Kyiv as a municipality, as a city, which is one of the largest uh, cities in Ukraine, and definitely demand for electricity will be growing. If we see more technologies competing with each other, and if we remove entry barriers, like connection to the grid, this is where they block you coming as a newcomer uh, investor. And we as parliament, we just passed a major legislation electricity market bill, which is setting the ground for many new, uh, new players to come in each and every type of generation, specifically for electricity. What we've done with gas market, it's already, we see it at play. Many Western companies uh, come to Ukraine and offer gas to uh, industrial uh, consumers. We still need to do a lot in terms of household uh, consumers. We need to make it efficient. so population appreciates energy as something useful and valuable to them. So this is the way we, uh, we keep uh, in our uh, mm -hmm. parliament right now, and we are going to continue. So you, you used a magic word that is efficient. And I remember Carlos many times saying, the cheapest energy is the energy you don't consume. So how do you think we could make some progress in terms of energy efficiency and reducing the waste? Let me, I'm not going to answer your question yet. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because I, I, there's a really important point um, following on from what Olga just said um, that relates to how do you finance the cost oh. of renewable energy. Right? Because you have to think about it from the perspective, I mean, we've got two here two major um, renewable energy producers, right? And all of the capital costs are up front, okay? So you have to be able to finance it in some way. And depending on what the cost of finance is, it's going to have a huge impact on the cost per, per megawatt hour. So in Mexico, you asked, recent auctions, $30 per megawatt hour, right? Three cents a kilowatt hour, okay? Less in a couple of cases. Let me tell you how they're financing it. The companies that have been winning have been major international companies that have international production lines for the equipment, so the lowest possible cost. Right. They've set up um, systems for implementing the projects so that they have the lowest possible service costs in the process of doing it. And they're financing it on their own books. And the cost of capital to them, Sorry, let's say, might be 6 or 7%. Now, you go to Ukraine and you take into account the risk country country. risk and capital risk. And where are you, 20%? now, if you incorporate country risk? Okay, so financing a project of $500 million at 5% or 6% versus 20%, and you amortize that and you look at the cost per megawatt hour, and suddenly the three cents a kilowatt hour you have in Mexico is something you just, you won't have in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So one of the critical questions is gonna be, what are the conditions that are created to be able to finance those projects? Are there companies like Northland or Axiona or Enel or Iberdrola that are willing to come? Are they willing to finance projects on their balance sheet? Right? And so this one particular company in Mexico, they did this and then three years later, after they started to get a cash flow, the company issued a corporate bond for 7%. Mm -hmm. All right. So it gives you a sense of how important the financing aspect is, because if you can't get that right, you can't make it cheap enough. 
and, and it's not just the financing requirement of the investors, but the whole banking sector. You know, you can put together a deal. Right now, debt, long-term debt on the markets is extremely cheap. We've never seen it like this, right. and yeah. who knows how much longer. So you can put in a way to, we, we would typically finance our projects with a project finance model. We're putting up a minimum amount of equity and tapping the debt, the debt markets, and the debt markets are very supportive. There's a lot of liquidity, a lot of capital, but they rely on in, in giving that money or, or lending that money into jurisdictions that are stable, that are for, that you can foresee where it's going, where there's all the other fundamentals come together, which Ukraine is kind of not there yet. And Ukraine has to, I think, really set its goal to move in that direction. And some of the things are really hard. You're not going to change the sovereign rating of the country right. tomorrow. But in the energy sector, there are, I think, some positive signs. You know, when you start looking at even under the way the tariff is, is handled, you know, the, the linking of the currency risk to another currency is very important because that's another factor that, that investors and bankers would look at. They don't want to lend to you in euros to buy your equipment in the West and then get paid back in hryvnia, which is an, a currency that's quite likely to do, devalue significantly over time. So you have to look at the currency risk. You have to weigh in all the, the, the factors of the uh, uh, political and other risks that are coming out there. So uh, one, th one thing I think is very important that we've seen in jurisdictions, even if you have a feed-in tariff or something with the, with the government standing behind the payment, it's structured as a contract between us, the generator, and the off-taker and a contract which can then have enforceability, if necessary, outside of Ukraine. Sovereign countries don't like to do that, but at, at, at these early stages, it's very important to do that kind of thing. Give us comfort that we'll, okay. we'll have recourse. Olga, okay, you wanted to say something? Well, about? I'm hearing you, but it is my job <laughs> to work with you so my voters are satisfied. I work for them, and I will make sure that you are satisfied on you know, getting appropriate ROI and mitigating all the risks which may pose my country at this particular point. And that's why, at this point, we have green tariff, which is the highest possible green tariff any country can offer you. I don't think any other country is compatible to Ukraine right now. So and that's why on 15th of December, OPIC approved a major funding for some of the projects they are considering right now for renewable energy wind in particular in Ukraine. And I can tell you, as a legislator, I work with two industries, gas and renewable. And I have way more meetings right now from interested investors with renewable industry than with gas industry. Which is to say, if you are going to invest in Ukraine, do it now. Because in our law, the green tariff is set in euro, it's stable, it's in hard currency, but it's on a sliding uh, schedule. It will change soon because people understand that technology is getting cheaper and we have expectations that you know the tariffs, the price for a uh, customer will also be cheaper. But we understand that we are not yet there okay. with 1.2%. The market is just a new baby and we need to protect this market. We are fully aware of it. But I'm also responsible vis-a-vis -vis you because I do want to make sure that there will be no agreement between current government and you which will be overruled By because the next people government. are not satisfied. Mm -hmm. I think we are all facing very different reality, political reality right now in many countries, including my own. People were not happy with the agreement previous government ma made with Russia. Look at what happened to that president and few of the prime ministers. We were not happy with the agreement on gas. We, we, we went to Stockholm and we, we made sure that some stupid clauses which were satisfying political ambitions of particular prime ministers were overruled. People will not accept if conditions are not fair, but people are eager to see more solar, wind, biofuel. They, are, they want to see jobs. They want to see solar panels produced in my own country, which is if anything, creative, innovative, and we have many opportunities, just be fair with us. And I am sure that the, the beauty of, of this particular energy type, alternatives, is that if you include people, not only as consumers, but workers, as you know, owners on local level, you will have them protecting your interests. So, you will not I, 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 I want... Quick, can I make yeah, one quick e, one comment there that I think everyone has to be very careful about? You you sort of put in there that you know you want to see panels manufactured in Ukraine. Well, 
if it's possible. That, that, that's only the, and, and it's, it's, it's a goal. A lot of governments said, you know, they want to use the energy sector to solve industrial problems, to create employment, all sorts of things. You have to be very careful when you go that path. We, we did similar in Canada. We did our first uh, solar projects in Ontario. And another same similar story. The government had a policy to encourage uh, a manufacturing of solar panels and things like that. So to do that, they did a, a survey and they ended up setting the tariff price at 42 Euro, uh, Canadian cents per kilowatt hour. <laughs> Huge amount. Everybody sees that. The first thing that happens, every, everybody in the supply chain realizes, how much can I take off the table to leave the developer just enough to keep him going and I'm going to capture all that difference. And they started working all that. At the end of the day, though, the pricing on the panels, once you open it up to broader competition, fell so significant that 42 cents is ridiculously high. And we get it and we're happy with it, but let's not kid ourselves. It's, you know, it's, and it's a, it is a, it's a problem that you have to be very careful about to not use policy. If you open up your whole supply chain, if you make it as, as, as transparent and easy for everybody to supply equipment, for everybody to buy and install it, your consumer will benefit much more than, than anybody. And what I would just say, Olga, is that Models that are used for finance mm -hmm. are going to be um, critical to the success. There's a lot of experience that we've seen even in Europe. Um, Spain could tell <laughs> us a, a number of the problems that occurred with, with feed-in tariffs that were set too high and resulted in bankrupting the government because they couldn't sustain the subsidies. And then um, wind farms and solar farms collapsed. Right. And so the structure of finance and its viability and its longevity is key. And you have a lot of friends um, internationally who are very happy to work with you on it. But that's certainly a role for public policy, is to understand and set the parameters for public policy that will get it to work. And you have been more central to that, that general direction than anybody in Ukraine. So let's talk about it at some point, and maybe there's some things that we can do that can be helpful. And in the meantime, it's, it's absolutely critical what you mentioned about OPEC's role. I mean, they're, they're, you know, the, in here the West is willing to step up and take some of that risk off the Ukrainian side and the benefit of the investor, and you should take advantage of that. But that's sort of a temporary measure to get you to where you're standing on your own feet. You don't have to rely on their, on their support. And everybody will see Ukraine itself as a, as a great counterparty on a, any kind of transaction. So just for you to know, before we started the panel, I asked the panelists to systematically try to disagree with each other. I didn't expect Carlos and Boris to so fundamentally disagree with everything <laughs> all the guys saying. So guys, kudos on that. Uh, I'd like to open the debate to uh, the participants here. So if you could please raise your hand, present yourself and ask the question as briefly as possible because this will allow us to have more questions from the audience. Please. There's a microphone here. I would advise you to use it because don't forget this is also a, a streamlined on YouTube so that if you want the audience on the World Wide Web to listen to you, speak closer to the microphone. Uh, recently my friend feels, uh, felt offended uh, when I made that comparison, but I want to ask you a similar question. So if you look at Africa, there is like a two schemes how uh, energy sector can develop. If country uh, doesn't have energy, a government may step step in and pay a uh, high capital cost to, to the developer. And the other uh, way is to build uh, solar panels, uh, smart grids. So my question is, um, what is the place of IT industry in reforming Ukrainian energy industry? Okay, we'll perhaps take an, a second question and then we'll come to, to the panelists. Anybody else? Okay, you'll give it some time to think about a second question. Who wants to answer this first question? Go ahead. Olga, they all agree. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all agree Olga should start. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least there is some agreement here. But, um, uh, I have to say, I, I visited recently um, office of our Ukrainarga, and I was amazed at what kind of duties do they have right now on the, in, in the current Ukrainian electricity market? Well, to begin with, we have five type of generation, uh, types of uh, electricity generation, starting with nuclear, and then you go to uh, heat, coal-based uh, generation,
competition, etc. You know? And to balance the demand, you actually need a lot of sophisticated software, you know, the demand and supply. And we see our goal as legislators from this particular committee, energy committee, building more connections with Europe. So Ukrainians and Europeans can benefit from each other in one common market. As of now, we are more integrated with Russia because of the uh, you know, former engineering solutions. So as we plan these policy steps, there, there will be tremendous need on the side of the government or, or operator to balance all the needs of the market. But this is on huge scale. But the dream I have is actually see more villages, more houses being self-sustainable to manage their demand and supply and being producing and buying and selling and whatever. We don't know what is ahead of us. Let's imagine Elon Musk is very successful with his uh, batteries. And then me and my husband, we sit down, we calculate and we decide, well, let's separate from the grid. We can, you know, have three types of different generation on our own and we will, you know, just preserve energy the way we want. What will happen to infrastructure? Who will manage all the data points about, you know, price and everything else? But this is like, I think, I think IT industry is one industry I'm not worrying about <laughs> in Ukraine. I think you have great prospects and in energy in particular. Mm. Boris, you want to I say would, something? I, would, I, would, I can't no. speak specifically to Africa or anything like that, but I would I'd make a little bit of a comment around the issue of scale of these projects. Mm -hmm. You know, things, houses, you know, solar panels on houses, all, those are all, I think, useful and can play a role. But in terms of overall efficiency, capital efficiency mm -hmm. and everything else, nothing will beat a large centralized installation for the development, for the, uh, uh, you know, you just, the infrastructure that you build. And, you know, we, we look at it from the point of view of wind turbines. On a levelized cost of energy, it is much more efficient for us to put up an offshore wind farm of 600 megawatts, and you know the price will go down that much more than to do a whole bunch of little ones at three megawatts. You know the, the efficiency is just just not there. So, and 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 uh, wind is great, but when the wind's not blowing, it doesn't produce a lot of energy. You need you need a backbone of a baseload system, and there your your centralized uh, generation is probably the best. Or increasingly, and here's the challenge, is a battery storage solution, yeah. so that you can take all that wind that you produce when you don't really need it, but it's windy, store it to when you need it. I think that's kind of the, the, the next really big frontier, and so many steps are already being taken, and you can sort of see both in terms of battery technology as, as batteries as we understand them, or other types of storage technologies, whether it's a hydro storage or other things that you can do. But that is the big challenge, I think, to sort of make sure that you can capture all that renewable energy so that when it's produced intermittently, you can still dispatch it when it's needed. And battery storage is going to play a big role there. Mm. You know, I, I mean, one of the things that you're facing in the uh, energy market, particularly the electricity market, is that you want electricity when you need it. You want to turn on the light and you want to have it. You want to have it consistently and you want to have it cheaply. And you don't, in the end, for some people you're going to care about whether it's wind, solar, or other sources. Um, probably a significant part of the population doesn't want to know at any given moment or minute of the day what's happening. And the interconnection between those two is going to depend on the world of IT. Smart grids, I mean, essentially what they mean is that you have a world that's generating wind, solar, nuclear, gas, coal, demand-side management, i.e. energy savings and, re and, and reductions. And how do you figure out which one is cheapest at which time? And if you had to have individuals figuring that out, you would fail. And so the whole purpose of IT and the integration into grids is to create the cap capacity to create an integration of technologies to identify which the cheapest technologies are and then let's take that another step further that Ukraine is far away from, but it's going to come, and it's going to come really fast. It's what happens in the home. So you go to many European countries. The UK, for example, has legislated a deadline for creating smart meters in every individual home. And increasingly what's going to happen with those smart meters is that they're going to be controlling what kind of how you use your heat, how you use your power, which power you use, 
what you turn off at which given time, and how it gives you the cheapest sort of ability to use your power domestically. What it's telling us is that IT is becoming a fundamental component mm -hmm. of what happens in the energy sector. And companies, and so to be able to do all of this, it also means that you have sensors on it. <coughs> so if you go down the road to Microsoft or any of Google or any of these other <coughs> entities that are there, what their, their whole business is, they're the kings of sensors, right? And so they have data that's coming in and what they're living off of is well, how do you use that information to create new businesses, to create new competition, to create greater efficiency? So what we're increasingly seeing is that the world of energy is not just going to look like companies like Axiona or, Axiona or Northland. It's actually going to look like Apple's and Google's Google. and Amazon's because of the control of the data as well. So information technology is going to be fundamentally integrated more and more into what every single company, energy company, is doing. I'm sure if we ask these two here, um, I don't know if you want to volunteer anything about Axionia, but I know that you're becoming a high-tech company at the same time that you're an energy company. Do you want to add something on that? Yeah. M microphone, please. Let me ask can you, can you correct the Close, closer to the microphone, it's okay. please. I'm Acciona Energy. I'm the CEO of you know, Energy. is a global company in renewables, very interested in the Ukrainian market. We are analyzing the, the market. And the only thing that, as a global investor, we need to invest in a project is a good location, a good site in terms of permitting or wind resource or radiation, a good price, a stable price. The stability is the most important, the long-term visibility, and a bank. And probably today, the banks, commercial or multilateral banks, are still a bit reluctant in order to finance long-term uh, projects in, in Ukraine, maybe because the long-term visibility of the feed-in tariff. Could you add something about it? Well, I have to say, let's sit down. Let's be pragmatic and talk concrete and specific projects, and I'm sure we can find a way how you uh, finance your projects. If it is, once again, fair, if it creates opportunity not only for uh, for the company. Let me give you an example. Right now there are a lot of talks about Chernobyl, you know, Chernobyl, uh, you know, the, the whole area there is um, analyzed as a possible case for both solar and wind. There are different legal rules for that area. So personally, as a citizen, I actually think the cost of the company will be lower compared to, let's say, Kiev area, where land is more expensive, where you have need to improve some of the um, infrastructure around, or whatever. But if we sit down and if we, you prove by the numbers that your project creates long-term opportunities for Ukraine, I am sure current government will find a way how to provide you guarantees, stable guarantees, so you are interested. I'd like to come back to, to the question that Carlos mentioned about uh, all the sensors and the uh, optimization. Uh, my experience with sensors in Ukraine is that when you're in a house, in an apartment or a building and you really suffocate because it's overheated, you open the window to get some fresh air and that's a very modern technology of regulating energy consumption. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's the most efficient way and uh, actually Ukraine has been for many, many years the worst efficient, energy efficient country in Europe. So Olga, could you, could you tell us a bit about that? What is being done to, to change the situation now? And are we making any progress? I, with all your love and passion for Ukraine, and Thomas uh, used to live and work in Ukraine, you should never mention Ukraine and the word worse. <laughs> it's always creativity, innovation, and opportunity. And I <laughs> I'm just looking at the figures. <laughs> no, 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 no. We are somehow troubled. <laughs> Never use the word trouble with Ukraine, please. There are some which are which are opportunities for investors. If you are coming with technology, helping citizens and companies to uh, be more energy efficient, I am ready to meet whenever you want to have that meeting. And I'll take you and we will go to mayor of Kiev or, you know, prime minister, whomever, 
to guarantee that you have fair consideration of your deal. But let me tell you, last year in my apartment, I changed just a metering for heating. And you should know in Ukraine, alternative in energy means mainly electricity at this point. A little bit but for uh, biogas and biofuel, but it's, it's still very minor. Uh, heating is always generated b uh, with Central. gas, mm -hmm. which is extremely expensive okay. and politicized for us. So for me, when and I live in a modern building, so I had an option of changing meter on <coughs> my, you know, in my particular apartment, and now I can switch off and I, mod uh, you know, manage my own heating and all the rooms, and it's very comfortable, and I pay three times less than my neighbors above and beyond who are not doing it. So I think it's a very informed choice of informed person who had a data. Yeah. And I do it in every single talk as a politician to communities where I travel and companies. We find solution right now for uh, metallurgy companies, mm -hmm. for uh, chemical companies. But the best way to make sure that there is incentive on the side of customer is to remove subsidies. Because this is misleading. You know, people think, oh, energy is cheap. We can actually continue consumer it at our you know, pleasure, no matter that we pay with blood for gas coming from Russia. We actually pay very high price. And some people are just not considerate of, of these circumstances. So at the level of a uh, country, we just passed major uh, legislation uh, on energy market, on gas market, energy regulator, and we are setting huge fund with the help of our EU partners to uh, have um, special uh, vehicles for financing um, loans for households, for companies, to change their uh, demand for electricity and heating. And I'm going to... I'm sure in five years, Ukraine will be a totally different country because now we are honest about price for electricity and gas, and we do something to mitigate this risk of people abusing you know, low prices and spending too much. Could we have the microphone here? There's another question from the audience. The gentleman here on the right. Thank you. Dirk Novak, Managing Partner of SDI Management Consulting, focused on the energy sector. Uh, following up on the comment uh, from Olga on what you're already doing and sort of addressing the energy opportunity uh, within your country, I would like to see if you, Carlos, could share, and of course that is also for the rest of the panel, any more experiences you have to avoid the kind of sort of inefficient regulation um, as you move from a sort of highly energy consuming, uh, highly CO2 producing um, uh, society to a more enhanced or advanced society. Um, in particular, reflecting on your comments earlier on Germany uh, in terms of the kind of funds wasted or even on the US in terms of the difference between you know, uh, government regulation at the country level versus at the state level. So keen to hear a little bit more on that. Carlos? First and most important lesson that I would say has been consistent across every single country has been the issue, exactly as Olga said, on subsidies. To the extent to which there are subsidies on energy and people don't recognize the value of the quantity that they're paying for, there's not an incentive to actually save it. And I think one thing in Ukraine um, that uh, Olga knows how it's functioned very well and there's been a huge effort to try to combat it. But just even the price differential play paid by households and by industry has become huge. Because if you can somehow be authorized to buy gas, um, to subsidize, to pay, to supply households, and you somehow divert that to industry, you've suddenly tripled your profits. Right? And that became a very real issue that was behind the Maidan revolution and some of the frustrations that occurred in Ukraine at that time. And so addressing these issues of subsidy and phasing them out of the economy is going to be key. It also becomes absolutely critical because if you think about over time the role that energy service companies have played in identifying energy efficient technologies, it's become critical to be able to have um, an unsubsidized price for energy so that the savings have a value 
and they can finance themselves by going to an industry or to a hotel or to a hospital and essentially say, I'll sell you my service and I'll pay myself by the energy that I save you, right? And you're only gonna do that if you actually have a real price of energy that is being charged that you can then turn into a contractual arrangement. Um, there's a debate which occurs. Um, it's been provoked in Germany, in Spain, in parts of the United States on the role of feed-in tariffs. And the whole idea of a feed-in tariffs was to guarantee that you would have a price that was paid for renewable energy for a period of time that made it attractive to then be able to build a project and then be able to obtain the financing for it. But when those feed-in tariffs were higher than other forms of electricity, then the question was that always arose is who pays the difference? Households don't want to pay the difference. Industry doesn't want to pay the difference because they're not competitive. If the burden is put back on government, then how do you finance that? Do you finance it through higher ta taxes? Okay, so that's what's led to this revolution of actually turning financing for energy on its head and moving to auctions, where governments have said, this is the amount of energy that I need. You, the developers of energy, bid on it mm -hmm. and give me your best price. And you guys figure out how you're going to finance it, and then I'm going to select the best price. And in fact, if I don't actually get something that's good enough for me, I will declare that bid null and void. Right? An important issue on regulation as well. I think that the final thing w which I would just say is that uh, to, it's a simple principle. It's one that is well known, but having transparency in the regulatory process is also key. Having a mechanism for industry to be able to comment, to provide feedback, and to be able to, to, for all parties to understand the nature of the regulatory measures has been a critical component to just be able to maintain its credibility anywhere in the world. So both Carlos and Boris have raised the issue of the uh, reversed auction. Uh, do we have it in Ukraine? And why no. not? No. Why, when are you implementing it in <coughs> Well, <laughs> no pressure. I have to make a disclaimer. First, not to scare some of the investors sitting here. At this point, we do have green tariff. As I said, it is quite an astonishing level of this green tariff. Mm -hmm. And we are going to keep our promise and pay it to the existing um, project. But right now, most of the institutional investors, EBRD, IFC, uh, IMF, whatever, you, you name it, all the embassies, we are in talks, we are in search of new mechanism, which will be working for new capacities, larger projects, because yes, I do want to see large scale, but if they bring cheaper price, I don't want to see large, if they, no. if they are the very expensive feeding tariff. But we are going to keep our promise as it is fixed in our law. Auctions is one of, the, uh, one of the schemes which is used in many countries, in Mexico, in India. But there are other schemes as well, feeding premium, uh, tax incentives. We are very open to consider different ideas to make sure that clean energy is more affordable than compared uh, with our current conditions. I, you know, again, I hate to say this because it's, it's not good from our competitive point of view, but auctions really are the solution. You, okay. But the way you have to do that, I think, is you have to really create a conditions and, and the, the circumstances where there will be five or ten serious bidders auctioning that price down to where it should be. And for that reason, you have to really make sure that the regulatory environment, environment is, make sure that the financing is, po is possible, make sure that the, uh, you know, all these things come together, and you're not there yet. I think quite clearly Ukraine's still not there. You have to work, you're working that direction. As I said, in the meantime, you're relying on multilaterals like OPEC to give some guarantees, and I think that's very useful. That'll create momentum in the field. But you should, that should really only be a stopgap until you can really put the system together so that companies like his and mine come in and beat each other up to give you the lowest price. Suppose. We're not going to do that yet because there are other issues that we have to deal with. You're from Ukraine origins. You used to live in Kiev. What would, what should be the one, two, or three priority actions that the Ukraine authorities should uh. take for you to convince oh, I'm, I'm your <laughs> CEO and your board to invest in Ukraine? What do you think should be the top priority? Well, I, I think the as 
Take notes. Take notes. <laughs> she, she, I, think she know, I think she already knows a lot, most of these answers already, right? I mean, in terms of us, you know, we're talking around this feed-in tariff and things like that. I think that, you know, even with, even with the feed-in tariff guaranteed by a government word is probably not sufficient to drive it further thing. <laughs> Things like contractual background behind that and making sure that we have, that we have access to other means because as, as Carlos pointed out, even in Spain, they weren't afraid to go and just arbitrarily chop, the, yeah. chop a tariff. And you know, clearly in Ukraine, it could happen even more so. And with all the other risks there, you know, I don't think you'll get a lot of players who want to take that risk upon themselves, especially when it's a large capital and not just the investors, but the bankers that we really rely on to give us a capital. So I think that's a very important step to make sure that your your uh, the contracts because you are for the next foreseeable future in some sort of a feed-in tariff arrangement. The question would be: Is that a feed-in tariff defined by the government or a feed-in tariff set by competition? That's that's a different issue. But whatever it is, you're going to have that, and I think that people want to see then the certainty behind that that the government. That, that is a number one in my mind step that I think the government has to take to make sure that happens. Obviously, all the other regulatory issues and making mm -hmm. sure that you can permit a project efficiently, that you're not going to get uh, screwed up by the interconnection arrangements. Those are all there and have to be worked out at the same time. But I would start with that financing tool at that level just to make sure that you can... And it's very interesting it. because you could say that of almost every type of industry in Ukraine, not just the energy sector. Yeah. It's even more critical for the energy sector because it's so capital intensive. But you could say that for almost every sector. Right, right. And so, that, you know, so you're not exposed to all kinds of potential changes in law that yeah. you know, all of a sudden the taxes go ridiculous or whatever else. You, you, you need some certainty in all these things. Okay. Other question? Could we have a microphone here in the front row? Guys, microphone. Woo. Thank Hello, you. Tahir Gosal from Azerbaijan. Um, I'm uh, curious about uh, the nuclear energy option uh, because we had our own experimentation. Actually, if you go to South Korea and you say you want a nuclear technology, they would provide the finance as well. And I was in, uh, in Abu Dhabi in the um, Atlantic Council Energy uh, Conference, and there was a, a, a very smart people from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they said, we have this new technologies, even in nuclear options, they have this material, not iron rods, but they use fiber. It's extraordinarily safe now, a, a nuclear uh, center now with today's technology, I think it's, it's phenomenal. I'm sure the Koreans would give you a 15, 20 years credit line and it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful source of energy because uh, in terms of viability of the sun, it's not only the, uh, you know, the price of the sun, it's also the quality of the sun in Ukraine, obviously is much less than in Nigeria. So that would also affect the cost of the project as well. The, 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 uh, so what, uh, have you ever thought seriously about nuclear? Is it a part of a government program? At least are you, are you dancing with this idea or no? Any plans for development further? Uh, you never know with, uh, with, uh, with our government. <laughs> but, but I actually, I, 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 have, I have positive future for nuclear as well. And here is why. Because cost-wise, it's a very legitimate option right now. But what I want to make sure is that my government is very serious about security and technology for the existing plans. <coughs> I would encourage but, you. Thank you. But, but nuclear, I mean, it's it's a challenge everywhere in the world, and the cost. I'm you know I'm not quite sure. I, sh I share your enthusiasm that you know the cost will be what it's going to be. In the UK right now, they've been working for years to try to make point going, uh, and they've now found you know despite the French are behind it, the uh, the Chinese, every sort of you know state financing all these things, the results of the recent auctions for offshore wind wow. are more competitive. And there's a pushback now, you know, nuclear, and you see a nuclear closing down in Germany, everywhere else. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, and I'm from Ontario, Canada. It's about 60% of our energy mix in our province, so it's a very important one. But I think going forward, the, the, the idea that more new things are going to be built nuclear uh, is, I'm not sure that we're going to see much in the next, I don't know, Carlos, what do you think? Uh, I think you're going to see nuclear in China. Uh, in China? And, but uh, outside of China, I think 
outside of that, uh, mm. there's really no other country in the world that's seriously developing it. Abu Dhabi was an exception, um, and it was an exception because they were willing to subsidize the cost of it, particularly subsidize the cost of decommissioning, and many of the costs that in Ukraine have simply been ignored, and <laughs> the, the recurrent costs ex extraordinarily low, but if you look at the full life cycle costs, it's, it's quite different. In the United States, uh, it's become a controversy because nuclear power plants are, are being shut down. Um, some might have their life extended, but one of the big debates now is should there be a special okay. subsidy for nuclear power plants because of energy security concerns, but then coming back to the issue of subsidies. So it, once you start to factor in the full cost, mm -hmm. you, you do get into some challenging issues, and um, if you're a tiny nation that is extraordinarily wealthy, like the United Arab em Emirates, <laughs> might have the luxury of being able to subsidize for energy security reasons, but not everybody does. Mm -hmm. Any other question? We just have one minute left before we close. So if there's no additional question, I would just ask the panelists, is there something that you would like to, uh, to add for, uh, for the audience? Boris? I, it, it's a very strange comment, and uh, half joke, half comment, but it, to the issue of Consumers and, and their reaction, I mean, consumers respond to financial stimulus. And if you're afraid that costs are too high, they might be. But if you give them the opportunity through their own behavior to not use as much electricity, they themselves will, will moderate just how much they're paying for electricity. So I wouldn't be so much afraid on the cost of the energy, but I'd be more concerned on just making sure that they can control their use of it, more. which you're already saying they're doing, which I think is very positive. But I, I think that's important. And just on an anecdotal level, you, you know, how people respond to price signals, I moved to Ukraine in 1991, uh, just as the Soviet Union was collapsing, and I was living with relatives. And I noticed every morning they'd go in and turn on their stove with their gas mm -hmm. stove in the morning and leave it on all day long, a burner, all day long. I go, why? Be kind of inefficient. It turns out that the major supplier of matches in the Soviet Union was Belarus, and it was all collapsing today, and they had a hard time finding matches at times. And they said, you know, the gas we don't pay for, it's not metered, it's free. They were behaving economically extremely rationally. Matches were probably more important than gas if you're not paying for it. So people will respond in the right way or the wrong way, depending on the context. <laughs> okay. Carlos? Um, Ukraine is a country of um, creativity and innovation and opportunity. <laughs> 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 Why did you get this line, Carlos? <laughs> uh, I'm going to put it um, And one aspect of it is the intellectual capital that you have. And you were base for the design of the um, nuclear, um, uh, in, in the times of um, the Cold War, of the control systems for the SS-18, for the SS-24, your computing capacity is absolutely incredible. And when you come back to your question of information technology, you have a capability that rivals um, most countries in the world. And so what we've increasingly found, and you see it in most of the discussions around Davos, what you've increasingly found is an integration of information technology and high tech with energy and that that becomes a defining edge in the ability to create new systems that are more efficient, that are resilient, that are cheaper. And I think that one of the things that you have is to create those market opportunities and to the extent to which you can find creative ways to open up the market, to tap that intellectual genius that's in your country, that that will create huge opportunities in the energy sector and will give additional benefits to the kinds of young, smart people, technologists that you have that are coming up in your society. So Olga, after that, what can you add? So, <laughs> um, I came to Davos so I could tape this panel make a transcript and use their quotes <laughs> to advocate for what I believe in. I do want Ukraine to be part of green energy revolution, but on my terms, which are good for my consumers, for my voters, for my workers, for my country. And I know how to make it. I want them to make informed decisions. That's why the question about IT gives me a promise that somebody will have a startup making sure that every household, company, small company, well, large companies can make these decisions on their own, I'm sure, but 
my voters, they need to understand true cost of energy in their life, that it is very valuable uh, resource for mm -hmm. them and opportunity as well. And then they will vote for politicians who will never betray national interest for cheap gas selling Crimea or uh, military base there. And they will make right decisions. At the same time, more jobs will be created in Ukraine because we are innovative. We are creative, you know, and we produce a lot of stuff which is very popular right now in Europe. We export to Europe and we are very proud of what it is. Be it skis, believe you, be, believe me, we, we now produce half of the skis for Europe. Would you think y yeah. Ukraine can do it? Yes, we can. So I, I'm sure we can do solar pa panels as well if we sit down and talk and find the right business model. So with that in mind, I'm very grateful to you that you moderated it. So it is very helpful to me in my political work back home. Well, thank you so much, Olga. I, I have to say a few thank you. Uh, uh, first, thanks to Olga, obviously. And something you might not know is that actually the idea of an energy panel was her idea initially. So. And, and it's very timely because this year in Davos, there are almost no sessions on energy. So we're very, very proud to have this session on energy. Second thank you is to uh, the Ukraine House Davos, Vasil and the team, and there are plenty of them here to have made this possible. Uh, obviously, Boris, because you supported, your company supported this panel, so a very yeah. special thank you to thank you. you. And, and Carlos, I mean, for sure the best energy specialist in Mexico, but also one of the very <laughs> best specialists in the United States and in the world, and somebody who has been passionately in love with Ukraine for so many years. So please thank me uh, and uh, join me in applauding these fantastic panelists. Thank you. <laughs> when you call the deal, you Okay, well done. <laughs> okay, Boris. Thank, thank you very you. much. That was very